Thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Matt Cicchini and I'm joined by uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay. And we're gonna talk about some basics of the histology of the pleura and uh, hopefully this will be an instructive video for everyone. Okay, so let's first start with some um, of the background anatomy. Um, so the way I like to think of the pleura is it's like you have a pillow inside of a pillowcase. And so you have your lung, which is kind of the pillow, and it's lined by this flattened layer of mesothelial cells that we call the visceral pleura. And that is lined on the outside by your parietal pleura that lines the chest wall. Um, and so in this diagram here, so we have the visceral pleura here that's along the lung, and then the parietal pleura that is lining along the chest wall. Anything else you want to say about this slide here, Sanjay? Or? Yeah, I like this pillowcase uh, thing, Matt. I yeah. never really thought about it like that. Yeah. So the visceral pleura is the pillowcase? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the the, the, um, the parietal pleura is the pillowcase, right? So the, the pillow, right? Like, because you have two things inside each other, right? And then yeah. the space between the pillow and the pillowcase is kind of oh, like I your pleura. So the outer layer of the pillow itself is the visceral pleura. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the parietal oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, the way I think of it is like the... Uh, you know, is I, I think of it as what is it stuck to? So mm. the visceral pleura is stuck to the lung. It's stuck to the lung on yeah. the outside. And the parietal pleura is stuck to the chest wall. Yeah. And the space in between is, you know, the, just the empty space is the pleural cavity. Is the, that's yeah. the way I think of, about it. Yeah. Um, which is then obliterated sometimes in effusions or in empyemas or mesotheliomas. You know, yeah. that space then that's how I think about it. Yeah, definitely. I think we have a gross picture of that that shows it's a that, beautiful that, picture because it yeah. also shows the mediastinum in the same thing. Very yeah, nice. definitely. Well, I think well, let's continue ahead, and I think we have that picture coming up. Um, so maybe we can just start with some of the basic normal um, histology here of the pleura. So I actually really love this photo. I think you took this one, Sanjay. Maybe you want to describe what you, what you have here, but this is one of my favorite photos showing normal. <laughs> Yeah, you know why, Matt, I just realized because we got another one like this. I okay. realized we never see normal lung because yeah. it, what's the what's the point of taking out normal lung? We yeah. never. So the only time I get like pristine normal lung is sometimes when they're doing a lung transplant. Okay. The uh, lung that they're putting in is, you know, which is sometimes completely normal, right? Sometimes the lung that they're putting in doesn't quite fit. Oh, so they do sort of like, like a lung volume reduction to fit it in. Oh, cool. And then the piece that they give us is normal, just completely yeah. normal. That's when you get a chance to take a picture like this, you know. Yeah, it, it's beautiful here. And so I think we nicely see this nice thin visceral pleura up top. Um, and then the higher mag on the right shows these kind of flattened mesothelial cells that are make up the visceral pleura. Yeah. Um, I think I, the thing I would point out, Matt, is... That, like when you think of it theoretically as a, as a medical student or even first year resident, you think, well, pleura lined by mesothelial cells, so I must see cells. <laughs> yeah. right? But when you look at it, they, you don't really see the cells. Most yeah. of the time, you just see this pink collagen, yeah. uh, just a thin layer of pink collagen, and you don't see any cells. And maybe the cells are too flat, like in yeah. part B. Yeah. Or maybe they're just, um, you know, sloughed away by the time it gets to histology. But most of the time, yeah. I, do you do you see the cells, Matt? Often? Well, I don't know. I think you can hallucinate the cells, right? Like, I, you know, like I think I can make out some little cells there, right? You know, maybe I'm convincing yeah, myself, yeah. but you know, I think if we threw a WT one on here, it'd pick up some things, and and I think they just get really flattened and elongated in normal conditions, um, um, when they're 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 not reactive, right? Correct. I mean, this bottom panel here, is this is not from the same case, right? Is this... Um... No, different. And I think this one is just a little bit reactive. So they're yeah. beginning to get a little plumper. Yeah. The nuclei are beginning to get round so you can see them. Yeah. Um, and of course, they're much more florid versions of reactive change than this. Yeah. Where they get really, you know, wild looking and then you can start thinking, is this malignant or atypical? Yeah. Definitely. And I think that's a good point too, is that... The, um, the amount of atypia in the cells doesn't really is not meaningful whether it's malignant or reactive conditions because the reactive changes can have really crazy looking atypia in them. Yep. Okay. I think this is the gross photo that we're talking about here. So, uh, did you want to tell us a little bit about this specimen that I think you had? Yeah, extrapleural pneumonectomia, one of the most classic I've ever seen mm -hmm. because it it's you know it's an intact ex lung you know yeah. completely surrounded by a rind of mesothelioma. Actually, it's such an um, you know incredibly rare resource. 
it took an hour and a half or so to, to mm -hmm. photograph this case. So what you're outlining there is really the rind, yeah. like, the, like the rind of an orange. Uh, that's all tumor. So all, everything that you're outlining in green is, the, uh, is mesothelioma cells yeah. surrounding the pleura and in a, in a sort of a continuous fashion. And when you look at this, you know, the two really main things that you should be thinking of is, is this mesothelioma by far and away the more common thing? And the second is a pseudo-mesotheliomatous carcinoma. Yeah. In other words, a carcinoma that's not forming an overt lung mass, but is tracking a, a entirely along the pleura. But I think mesothelioma is by far and away the more common. And then the more interesting thing I think here is that you see it actually going in along oh. the fissures, like there, yeah. yeah. So you see the tumor going along the fissure, so that it almost gives you a sense that the fissure is really a dipping in of the pleura, in a yeah. sense. It's a yeah. dipping in of the pleura into the lung. And maybe to some extent, uh, that occasionally happens down the interlobular septa too, which you don't see clearly on the gross mm -hmm. because they're too small. Yeah, but, no, I think, I think this, is, this is great. And then in panel B, this is where you're separating out the visceral and the parietal yes, breath. I learned from this specimen that, you know, on an extrapleural pneumonectomy, you can actually rip off the chest wall and parietal pleura portion. And that just comes off, you know, if it's, if it's not yeah. completely tightly adherent. So the, the, this would be the chest wall and the parietal pleura. Yeah, that's uh, so the little like the um, sort of the meaty looking bottom part is the actual chest wall. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, you know, brown portion at the bottom of the specimen is chest wall. In fact, that's probably diaphragm actually at that at yeah. that location is diaphragm and parietal pleura involved by mesothelioma and the space in between, Matt, if you can put your thing there. Yeah, that is the actual pleural cavity, you know, or what used yeah. to be pleural cavity before it was obliterated. And then this would be the visceral pleura, right? That would be the visceral pleura. Yeah. That's it's wonderful. Incredible. It's like it, it's like the tumor is outlining pleura for you. You know, it's showing you where the pleura is. Wow. Yeah. That's it. And then I think in the last one here, I think you can see a little bit of invading into the lung parenchyma here, probably, yes. right? Yes, kind of a little nodularity. And actually, one thing I wanted to point out, Matt, like in point in part A, if you look at that very apex of the specimen, there's a yeah. little bump. Yeah, that thing. So there, you know, it, you get into a little gray zone of is there a parenchymal mass or not? Actually, mm. I don't think there is in this case. I think that's just confluent tumor in the pleura. But yeah. that's why sometimes you get confused as to, or radiologists do, mm. or we do, as to is there a parenchymal mass or is it yeah. a pleural mass? Because it's so close together. You know, you, it's, it's, sometimes it's just hard to tell yeah, where exactly definitely. the mass is. Um, well, yeah, that's a great case. Yeah. I think also on part C, another thing is the uh, middle-sized arrow yep. shows you sort of adhesions between the mm. visceral uh, pleura and the parietal pleura chest wall. You know, that yeah. kind of cobwebby yeah. thing. It's really amazing what this tumor does. Very, wow. very bad. Wow, it's horrible. Yeah. Wow. That's a very great case. Thanks for sharing that, Sundry. Okay. Yeah, and, and then I think the next one we have here is um, um, appearance of what this looks like under um, in thoroscopic procedures where they're visualizing this. Yes. Um, I have to and, say that, you know, these are uh, uh, just pictures given to me by, by my surgeon's teaching files. Um, interestingly, you know, I was a little surprised to see this yeah. because it's so, it looks like bunches of grapes, you know, like yeah. something you would expect to see in a... Uh, in a mole of the, you know, hydrogen yeah. mole or something. Yeah. You know, I thought in my imagination, I thought it would be more rind-like or more, you know, solid yeah. masses. These are more more pink than I than I expected them to be. They're just pink yeah. masses, uh, completely. You know, first of all, it's not diffuse, but it's it's uh, covering large portions of the pleura. Yeah. And the pleura, if you can just point to it, Matt, like where, where is the pristine pleura? Like the, the white arrow pretty much is the pristine yeah. pleura, right? Um, shows you the difference between what normal pristine pleura should look like. Like it's yeah. just a thin layer through which you can see the lung and its vasculature. Mm -hmm. And then the mesothelioma is just these masses, you know, these confluent masses yeah. all over the pleura. Different than a solitary fibrous tumor, yeah. which is just a single... Lump, definitely. You know, lump or mass. Um, so again, yeah. I think the differential is meso and carcinoma. Yeah. 
I, I always think like these these areas here that have this more polypoid kind of look to them, like almost grape-like, as you mentioned, like, I wonder if that's just how they're growing because they're growing into this potential space, right? Yeah. And there's nothing on the other side. So I guess the biology is, is that they're going to kind of look like this, right? Because yeah. um, they're just growing into air essentially, right? Correct. And as we mentioned, um, in, or, or we are going to in the book, Matt, like yeah. it, it's important for pathologists, and at least I do this in all my cases, where I have a surgical biopsy, I try to look at the surgeon's note. You too. To see, did they see a diffuse uh, process growing along the pleura? Because if you, yeah. if they did not, calling something mesothelioma is is a very, very dangerous thing to do. If they didn't see a you know, diffuse a mass-like or rind-like process. Definitely, and and the imaging too, which I think we'll we'll see in a second. I think is an important aspect as well, just to and and the patient history as well to make sure. Yeah. Hey Matt, goes. in part B, are, isn't it amazing how well you can see the vasculature? On the I know, floor? isn't it amazing? It's incredible. I mean, the the surgeon's view of things is so different than our view of things after the lung comes out. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, it's so different than in vivo, all the stuff that happens. You know, we, yeah. we just get these gray lumps. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that um, uh, we don't see detail, but we see a different kind of detail, you know? Yeah. I, I if Someone was talking to me about before about how a lot of areas of medicines might start to merge more, like as, as these surgical have the ability to get like microscopic examination of things or magnify down to, you know, the this really detailed level or radiology can do these molecular type of imaging things, you know, I think pathology is going to start to meld a bit with some of these other specialties, right? Like, yes. you know, when, once they can start zooming down and, and, and visualizing these things. So I think it's, it's really cool and exciting, I think, for the future of this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So then I think next one we have here is some imaging. Um, so these are kind of the classic pictures of mesothelioma on imaging. So uh, on the left one here, we th I think we have largely have this pleural effusion that's basically filling up the whole space along and it's basically causing a, um, a shift towards the other side here. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's a little bit of a potential rind here. I think that that was highlighted down in the box down here. Um, and then I think better seen here on this cross section here, you can, you can yeah. see this, this, this nice rind here that I think is tracking along the fissure again that correlates nicely with, with, with what I think we saw in the gross there in the previous um, okay. case. Which um, you know the one on the on part A, yeah. essentially you can't see any lung, right? The lung is yeah. completely just collapsed, yeah. which is why I think I I feel I you know I feel the cytologist's pain because yeah. the cytopathologist doesn't have the surgeon's view of things, yeah. and at the time they are looking for any clinical data to help them. All they see is that you know yeah. they see just one big pleural effusion and they don't know whether the mass is in the lung or a rind like thing, yeah. so they are dealing with a much harder call than we are yeah definitely and and i think it's it's very challenging to call these things on cytology right i think very difficult yeah the the main thing is is excluding a carcinoma basically i think and correct and i know, think that's why you know the bap one is actually more helpful to cytologists than great. to us yeah because frankly for, for uh, most of the mesotheliomas i see are pretty easy to call yeah on, on the you know on a surgical biopsy plural, mm. plural biopsy um, and of course, there are some that are harder and need the weapon. But for cytologists, almost everything is difficult to call. You know, yeah. so they need some handholding from the from the immunohistochemical point of view. Yeah, I think the bat one can be great to push things from suspicious, you know, um, you know, towards more favoring positive from mesothelioma. Yeah, because you can't see the invasion there, right? Um, Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And then I think we have, these are some histology images as well as some immunohistochemistry here. So on the left here, we have kind of the classic features for an epithelioid type of mesothelioma. So we have these epithelial appearing cells that are invasive here into the surrounding tissue. Um, and they kind of just grow as the, in, in, they can in some cases have more tubular papillary structures, but in this thing, I think they're a bit more of kind of like sheet-like infiltrative growth appearance. Um, and the important differential in this is, we, I think we have to prove this is not a carcinoma. Um, and so we do this with immunohistochemistry because morphologically there's some soft clues um, that I think we go into in the book, but 
I, I think, you know, you really need to do the immunohistochemistry to prove that this is mesothelian or, origin. Would you agree with that, Sanjay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I find it a little hard to explain to trainees what the differential is. Yeah. Because on one hand, the differential is really between this and lung adenocarcinoma, right? That's what yeah. really the main differential or pseudomesotheliomatous ad lung adenocarcinoma. But honestly, the differential is wider, you know, like yeah. you can have a lung squamous, a small cell, a metastasis to the pleura yeah. from a umpteen number of different things. Yeah. So your mind has to be open yet when you're dealing mostly with, you know, these are mostly older men with a, with a unilateral pleural effusion, yeah. really, honestly, your big two are mesothelioma and lung adeno. Yeah. And then all the other things are a little further down. And then essentially when you're keratin, pancytokeratin positive or with a morphology like this, most of those things are already ruled out, you know, um, most of the other things, melanoma and metastatic mm -hmm. RCC, you know, but you do have to keep that in mind, especially if somebody has a history of a malignancy somewhere else. Like if yeah. you knew somebody had a, a, a renal cell carcinoma somewhere or a ovarian carcinoma or breast. Or breast, yeah. Of course you would be thinking of that in your differential. But this panel that uh, you're, you're beautifully photographed here, Matt, the panel is mainly uh, meant to differentiate mesothelioma from adenocarcinoma. And when people say, well, mm -hmm. but this was a mesothelioma and it didn't pick it up. Well, it's not, uh, I'm sorry, this, is a, this was a melanoma and the panel didn't, work well it's yeah. not meant for melanomas you know yeah no I, I i agree with you completely i the um i guess i conceptually think of it as in kind of tears working through it you know like so if if if, if something doesn't fit initially i i usually just start very basic with just like a pan keratin you know and then if it's pan keratin positive then i'm going to go down the mesothelioma versus carcinoma pathway but if it's pan keratin negative, then I'm, I, I often stop and then do a broader panel to make sure this is not a melanoma or something else. Um, I'm surprising. Can I ask you, Matt? <clears throat> yeah. Just a, um, just a kind of, uh, it's, this is not science, right? It's just like, yeah. I'm asking you, what is your favorite mesothelial marker out of the three? Like, which one do you trust the most out of these three? Do I trust them? Well, I, I think the, the, I think a pan keratin is really important because um, I, I find that that's going to stain both mesothelioma and carcinoma, but I really like that to first highlight the cells. And, and then, you know, the, what's my favorite one? You know, I think WT1 can be good. It tends to be clean and tends to be uniform, but it's, um, it's not, it's no, you don't see it in every case, but I think when it's there, that's the one I often like the best. You know, calretinin can be a little bit challenging to interpret sometimes. I find that it's not always there, um, but the ones that have nice solid WT1 would probably be my favorite. I don't know what do you think, Sanjay. Yeah, no, I know. I I agree with all of that. I personally, I think of like calretinin as the like the prototypical mesothelial yeah. marker. But there are occasional tumors that are negative for calretinin too. Yeah. I mean, among the epithelioids. And in my experience, at least, almost all sarcomatoid mesotheliomas are negative yeah. for everything. There's only an occasional one that's positive for WT1 or D240. Yeah. But I, I think in the sarcomatoid ones, I yeah. almost expect that everything will be negative. Yeah. Uh, but the epithelioid ones are usually positive for all of them. And when one of them is negative, I'm, I'm not too concerned as long as the other ones are, are positive. So that's why the panel helps because yeah. you can't really go with one because uh, each one of these can be negative in an occasional case. Definitely, yeah. And I, I always do at least two or three. I, I try and do at least three markers on both sides for carcinoma and mesothelioma. So in this case, we have three mesothelial markers, cytokeratin 5, 6, WT1, calretinin, and three carcinoma markers, BRIP4, Mach31, and polyclonal CAA. Yeah, I find also that these are very, very difficult for trainees to remember, the yeah. right side of markers, you know? Because BRI P4 and Mach 31 and even CA are not things that um, other specialties use very often. You know, true. So they just find this like a like a jumble of letters and numbers that's very difficult to uh, remember. And the boards make it worse. You know, they I think they try to confuse you between CD15 and LUM1. Ah, uh, yeah. And then they try to use it in the Hodgkin's setting and try to confuse you even more. CD15. <laughs> <laughs> just makes things difficult. Oh, that's tough. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I don't have a perfect way of, of remembering uh, these. Uh, um, 
but I don't know. Do you have a, have a good way of remembering them? No, you know, I think for us, it's just we do it so often that it kind yeah. of embeds in your brain. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a mnemonic or anything. <laughs> you should think of one. Yeah. Um, the, okay. So that, that's IHC for mesothelioma. I think we could just contrast that with the stating pattern that you'd see in a lung carcinoma. So same thing, they have these infiltrating epithelioid sheets of cells that, you know, maybe there's some subtle differences between the mesothelioma, but there's a big histologic overlap. And so you need to do the stains. So TTF1 can be really useful, as we mentioned. The main differential off these cases is mesothelioma or lung adeno. And so this case was TTF1 positive, and then we have positivity for Burry P4 and then polyclonal CEA, whereas the mesothelial markers in this case, calvaretinin and WT1 are negative. Yeah. Oh, um, Matt, I yeah. just remembered something. Can you go back to the previous sure. slide? Yeah. So one thing very important to mention, I think people really sometimes get this wrong. So CK56, as you can see, is a cytoplasmic marker. I mean, it's, yeah. that's really the bulk of staining. But WT1 is a yeah. nuclear marker and should only be considered positive if it's positive in the nucleus. Now, what I see very commonly is, uh, and people don't know, is that WT1 will stain the endothelium of capillaries. This is very, very common. And that is sometimes misinterpreted as positive by people who don't know that this can happen. So remember, cytoplasmic positivity doesn't count, even if it's in the tumor cells. And then, you know, um, expect endothelial cells to be positive in a cytoplasmic fashion. So it must be nuclear. And then calretinin is one of the few stains that has both nuclear and cytoplasmic yes. positivity. So you have to see that just a little blush in the cytoplasm, at least for me, is not enough, Matt. I don't know. How do you tackle those? I, I, I agree completely. It has, it has to be nuclear and cytoplasmic. Um, yeah. But so I will spend time hunting for... Uh, I will spend time hunting for the rare cells, but it has to be both nuclear and cytoplasmic to be meaningful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you have to also in Plura, and you know, another pitfall is that normal mesothelial cells that will be positive for all these markers. So <laughs> you true. have to be able to tell what's malignant and what's yeah. benign before you go hunting for the yeah. uh, positivity. It's it's quite tricky. Yeah, they, these these are always the challenging cases. These are these these are cases you want to look at with a fresh brain. I think. Uh, Yes, I actually forgot what the third one is. So there are, I'm th thinking of things that need both nuclear and cytoplasmic positivity. And I remember S100 and calretinin, and there is- uh, I think P16 one. often has nuclear oh, yeah, and cytoplasmic. Yes, yeah. yes, true. Yeah, that's a good kind of small list to keep in mind for <laughs> residents, first year yeah. residents, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, and I think just this is kind of a nice contrast of a plural plaque. Um, and so this has a very nice kind of basket weave appearance. I think that's the classic buzzword that you often hear with this, where um, you have this, it looks very, this collagenous type fibrosis and you have these little holes or spaces, like someone has weaved all these little um, collagen um, bands together to make yeah. this appearance. Um, and then the big differential for me here is a desmoplastic mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, one of my mentors um, always taught me that the desmoplastic looks spooky swirly. So it's not this uniform basket weave appearance, but you'll start to see these swirls that kind of have this almost spooky appearance to them. And that's, um, that, that's a, a tip off that there's something more going on here. And I think in those cases, a pan keratin can be really helpful to yeah. highlight that um, morphology to it. But I think that's the, the big pitfall. Can I pitfall. give you a counterpoint, Matt, to that? So sure. the counterpoint is many people uh, actually uh, know this pan-keratin pearl, right? So they, yeah. they try the pan-keratin. The problem is that plaques will also sometimes show you diffuse pan-keratin positivity, yeah. and so will fibrosing pleuritis. So the one thing to remember is that, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. Pan-keratin is a great stain to, to you know, is sometimes in, in sarcomatoid mesotheliomas, of which desmoplastic is one, is... Uh, often the only thing that will mark the tumor, right, is a pan-keratin. And it will show you how diffused the, the thing is. But remember, that is not proof of malignancy. In other words, sometimes in a plaque or fibrosing pleuritis, you will get diffused pan-keratin staining, and that's not enough to call something malignant. You have to hold out in this differential, in a uh, you know benign versus desmoplastic mesothelioma, you have to hold out for infiltration of something benign, like a uh, adipose tissue or skeletal muscle, and this is really one of the hardest, hardest diagnoses in, in all of thoracic pathology. So it, it's, this is just, there's no immunohistochemical solution to this issue.
I, I agree with you completely, Sanjay. And I think the only thing is I, I would add is that sometimes if I have this really abnormal keratin IHC, but not invasion, I would never call it outright, but I think that would raise some atypia or, you know, in a comment, you know, describe this as more than just a pleural plaque. Correct. Um, yeah, um, that's a very good tip. And of course, people should know that pleural plaques are thought to be mostly asbestos related. And so... Um, they're sort of a marker of asbestos exposure the same way that asbestos bodies would be. Yeah. And same as asbestos bodies, they are not proof of asbestosis because asbestosis needs interstitial fibrosis. So neither plaques nor asbestos bodies prove asbestosis. They only prove asbestos exposure. And so they're kind of, that's their utility in clinical practice. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And it's something that I, I got tripped up on when I was in early on in my training, trying to figure out these different terms because they don't completely make conceptual sense when you first think of them, right? But uh, yeah. that's a great point to highlight. So I, uh, I think the last one we have here is a talc pleuridesis. And so often in patients who have recurrent um, um, pleural effusions, um, the surgeon will do a pleuridesis. And so this can be either mechanical where they just go in and basically roughen up the pleura and basically cause it to stick together. Or they can also use these uh, uh, chemicals like a chemical pleuridesis. And so one of the more common agents is actually talc. And so this is the same stuff that used to be commonly used in pill fillers. Um, it's less commonly used now as a pill filler. Um, and, uh, but they'll basically put some of this in the pleural cavity and this causes this, uh, this giant cell reaction that causes the layers of the pleura to basically stick together, right? Yes. And then, and that would make it less common for a, a repeat pneumothorax. And the, I think you can nicely hear, see here under this polarized light here, these, yes. these refractile particles here. And they, you repeat effusion you meant, right? Yes, yeah, so effusion. effusion, sorry, yes, yeah. Hey, Matt, do you, you're, you're Canadian, so do, do you speak French? Uh, un petit peu. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. So tell me, is there, isn't there a thing called poudrage? P o u d. Oh, uh, peau d'orange. Uh, no, like that. What they do with the talc? Isn't that thing called? Poudrage? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right? It's some kind of. Is that does that mean abrasion or? I can't. I don't know I, what it means. In I, I think so. I, I I'm I'm not the best in French. Exactly. I, I, <laughs> no peau d'orange, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's skin of the orange. That, that that that's something different. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, we it's we good. we only have to take French up until grade nine, and then then we stop. So it's uh, <laughs> I only know a small bit. But. No, this is a good, really good thing to know. Yeah. That uh, pleurodes. I think the the really one practical importance of this is uh, sometimes you'll get specimens where you have a mesothelioma, and then you have this talc thing mixed in with yeah. it. You know, and so it gets it gets difficult to tell what's tumor and what's not. So yeah. this, if you just polarize it, it it, it makes it super easy. I'm uh, uh, there, are a few things where a polarizer is helpful, and this is one of them. It just definitely. beautifully brings out the talc. Yeah, uh, definitely. It yeah. makes for a very nice photo as well. I think. Yeah.